So thank you everybody for coming back. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce the uh, second keynote for the symposium, our last keynote. Um, we have two uh, fantastic speakers with us today, uh, Professor Xiuling Shaw and Professor Daniel Sudi. Uh, Professor Xiuling Shaw is the Chancellor's Professor and Alvin and Sally Beeman Professor of Geography at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He's also the current president of the University Consortium for Geographic Information Science, UCGIS. And his interests cover transportation geography, geographic information science, space-time analytics, and human dynamics. Uh, Dr. Daniel Sui is professor of the Department of Geography at Virginia Tech. He's also senior president and chief research and innovation officer. Uh, and he's published numerous papers in GIS-based spatial analysis, modeling for urban environment and public health applications. So I'll keep that short and sweet and allow them to, uh, to pr present. Um, gentlemen, the stage is yours. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sharing my screen. Good, can you all see the screen? Okay, good. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Grant, for the introduction and also thanks to Yano for inviting us to give this presentation. Uh, as you can see, we have a loaded title. I will discuss the first part of the title, this framework for human dynamics research in a hybrid physical virtual world. And then Dan is going to take over and uh, talk about how this framework is related to quantum concepts in the emerging uh, metaverse. Okay, so I would like to start uh, this presentation with these two key shortcomings of conventional GIS in our humble opinion. First, we think conventional GIS have focused mainly on locations in absolute space and the other concepts of space and place are not properly addressed. And the second, conventional GIS have not paid sufficient attention to humans. And uh, we need to uh, consider humans are living and the dynamic objects with memories, feelings, perceptions, etc. And also uh, human beings now carry out their activities in an increasingly hybrid physical virtual world and uh, including the emerging metaverse. So uh, let's start from a uh, hybrid physical virtual world. So we humans need to carry out different kinds of activities and the interactions in our daily life in order to fulfill different needs, work, shopping, social, etc. And uh, modern information and communication technologies have significantly changed human dynamics in both physical and virtual spaces. So in physical space, we have used transportation to navigate between different places in physical space. And we have been using ICT now to navigate between different places in virtual space. And uh, we also need to keep in mind, these two spaces are not independent from each other. What we do in one space can influence and also are influenced by what we do in another space. So about 25 years ago, Michael Beatty already suggested that uh, different virtual phones have their own sense of place and space. In other words, their own geography. He also argued that what is crystal clear is that the future subject matter and method of geography will be very different as place and space and time itself become virtual in an age where the digital permeates all human activity. And uh, we think we are already in this age. So uh, last year, Facebook changed its name to Meta and uh, then Metaverse becomes a popular uh, discussion topic. Uh, of course, there are many, many different discussions about what Metaverse is. Uh, here, we just want to uh, present one of them. One way to understand metaverse can be it's a virtual world that is intertwined with the physical world, with the interactions between these two different worlds in an immersive environment. And uh, if we look at what's going on in the metaverse, there have been some interesting developments in the metaverse world. And also, we can expect metaverse can further change human dynamics in many aspects, especially when the technology becomes more user-friendly. For example, replacing those cumbersome head-mount uh, virtual reality headset with 
uh, lightweight high glass says uh, quite a few companies have been working on. And uh, this is a screen capture of Sandbox, which is one metaverse platform available out there. And uh, many companies are present in the metaverse. For example, in this December 2021, last year's article uh, in Fortune, and uh, it pointed out, for example, Nike, Gucci, Susby, Coca-Cola, Wendy's, they are all present in Metaverse. And also, this article uh, pointed out a plot of digital, digital land in Decentraland, which is an other Metaverse platform, sold in 2021 for $2.43 million, which was higher than the price of the average real-world Meta uh, Manhattan apartment. So even though I don't use Metaverse at this moment, but obviously uh, there are things, interesting things going on. So then our question is, is GIS or GIS science or more general spatial data science ready for human dynamics in an increasingly hybrid physical virtual world? Okay. And uh, that's why we propose this space place or spatial GI science framework for human dynamic research, which was published in the annals of AG in 2020. In this framework, we put humans at the center and uh, we consider humans as dynamic and living objects. Then in addition to the concept of location in absolute space, we also include the concept of locale in relative space the concept of place identity in relational space and the concept of sense of place in mental space in this framework. And more importantly, uh, these different concepts of space and place, they are not independent from each other. They are actually linked and associated with each other in human dynamics. So let me spend a little bit time very quickly uh, explain what this framework is about. So for the absolute space part, this is very much has been the uh, foundation of conventional GIS. So we try to represent locations in physical space uh, for different phenomena. And uh, this particular approach has served many useful applications and that will continue to be very useful. So we are not arguing we need to abandon uh, this approach of locations in absolute space. Then, in terms of relative space, for example, indoor navigation has become another popular topic. But how many of us actually use XYZ coordinates in absolute space uh, to navigate inside the building? Probably not too many of us. Instead, relative locations and the surrounding environment related to the concept of locale, situation, context probably are more intuitive to human beings. And also, if we think about autonomous vehicles, okay, and uh, what would be the position accuracy of GIS databases required to support autonomous vehicle operations? So for current in vehicle navigation, probably 10 to 15 meters accuracy level will be good enough. But for autonomous vehicles, minimum we need to be accurate to individual traffic lanes. That will mean three to five meters accuracy level then how about parking, especially in big cities? We are talking about maybe five to 10 centimeters, uh, a few inches. So the question is, is it feasible to build a global GIS database at this position accuracy level? Technically, yes, you know, we could do it. But then how often can we update or afford to update uh, this data? Uh, base at this accuracy level, it's going to cost quite a lot of money. Even we can update the database very frequently. We need to keep in mind, there are always moving pedestrians, uh, bicycles and other vehicles around us. So the conventional location in absolute space approach will not be sufficient. But in the meantime, we know of the sensors mounted <coughs> on autonomous vehicles, they detect relative locations of objects around a particular autonomous vehicle. 
So if we simply integrate locations in absolute space with locations in relative space, then this problem can be addressed relatively easily. And uh, then relational space, okay? Uh, during the pandemic, uh, probably all of us have uh, engaged in activities in virtual space more than uh, we used to be. Uh, so online social networks, all these online meetings, online shoppings, etc. Uh, also in the spatial data science GIS community, we also see a lot of uh, studies on social networks, for example. So, uh, but when we move into relational space, the focus now is on relations and the individual identity or place identity rather than absolute locations. So these kind of relations can exist in both physical space and virtual space that are important if we want to study many different kinds of uh, challenges we are facing, okay? Social uh, equity issues, okay? Uh, sustainable development and et cetera. Uh, finally, mental space, okay? So now the focus shifts to the mental and the cognitive aspects of humans. For example, if we do a quick search of Chinatown in New York City in Google Maps, we get a polygon showing the Chinatown in New York City. But if we do the same search using OpenStreetMap, we again get a polygon. But these two polygons are different. Which one is correct? That depends on how you perceive the boundary of Chinatown in New York City. There's no official boundary line. So this is also important in terms of dealing with spatial data. And uh, coming back to autonomous vehicles, for example, one day you are trying to cross a street and a car stops with engine running. You look at the driver and the driver is sleeping. How many of you would feel comfortable of crossing the street in front of this car with engine running? And the Stanford University actually did an experiment. Many people walked behind that car, okay? And uh, that's mainly because we human beings also need to have, in this case, for example, eye contact with the driver to make sure the driver sees us. So, you know, uh, if we want to uh, take care of this kind of consideration, then we simply need to add this autonomous vehicle and human interactions. For example, uh, autonomous vehicle can flash the light indicating I see you. So these are all important when we try to address different kinds of uh, challenges in uh, the world out there. So uh, let me summarize these four types of space. Absolute space works with absolute locations in space. And we focus on questions such as where are the different objects? And then relative space works with relative locations to either a fixed object or a moving object. For example, autonomous vehicles, okay, always detect uh, objects around itself and that will be in a relative space uh, with respect to a moving object. And uh, in relative space, we focus on questions such as what are around us. And the relational space works with relations to other objects. And uh, uh, the questions will be what are related to us. And the uh, mental space works with the cognitive and the mental aspects of space and uh, focuses on questions such as what do people have in mind? Again, they are not independent from each other. They are actually associated and linked with each other. So if we also try to integrate different concepts of place with these different concepts of place, then for absolute space, uh, it is associated with the concept of location and uh, which suggests a specific position or site that can be represented by coordinates. And uh, we have been doing this in conventional GIS uh, of the time. And uh, for relative space, the concept of locale is better related to the concept of relative space. In other words, our attention now shifts to 
uh, the situation rather than the site of a particular object. For relational space, uh, place identity will be more critical. Okay, in other words, now we focus more on relations rather than absolute locations. So identifying uh, identity among different places or individuals uh, will become critical in a relational network. Yeah. And uh, then finally, mental space. Uh, this is associated with sense of place. And uh, we attempt to reflect what people have in mind about a particular location, a locale, or a place identity that are associate, associated with those different concepts of space. Okay. So that's a quick uh, overview of this uh, human centered space place GI science framework. And uh, now I'm going to pass the uh, floor to Dan, who is going to discuss how. Uh, this framework is related to quantum concepts in an emerging metaverse. So, then, Thank you, Shilang. That's an excellent overview of the space and place uh, uh, of framework. Uh, you just heard Shilang gave a succinct uh, uh, de definition of uh, the metaverse. So, although Facebook, uh, you know, rebranded uh, its uh, business uh, as Meta last year, but if you you look at the history of uh, uh, how the concept of the, or the vision of metaverse has evolved. It has uh, been existed for quite some time. Um, uh, you know, about 20, 25 years ago, you know, the, there is an industry cons consortium report uh, that envisioned, uh, um, it's remarkable, uh, almost 25 years ago, you know, these uh, four components. You know, what we are, we as a GS scientists are doing our just uh, 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 one portion uh, of uh, the metaverse, the mirror world, because we are trying to, re you know, uh, represent the real, real physical world as accurately as possible. But in addition to the mirror world, you know, we have uh, this growing virtual world. It's a growing social media. We have uh, this life logging world, and then augmented reality. If you connect all these four quadrangles, and then we have uh, really this emerging complex um, um, you know, universe involving sensors and uh, immersions and uh, different identity and uh, uh, interactions, of course, uh, the interface and the network. N next slide, please. Shulang, next slide. Yeah, so with this emerging metaverse, what uh, is really significant, uh, in my opinion, is that they, it's, you know, it's another techn technological breakthrough that really further blurs the boundaries. We, we as geographers, geoscientists, scientists, uh, tr traditionally have been hold the so uh, 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 constant. You know, the, those boundaries are um, physical versus uh, digital. So I like I don't know what you think. We like the word, you know, they combining the uh, the physical versus the digital. We are definitely it's neither physical nor digital. It's a digital. That's the world we are increasingly into. But I think more broadly, the other um, you know geograph fundamental geographical concept: uh, urban versus rural, object versus subject masculine versus feminine. So all these boundaries in the in this emerging metaverse uh, are increasingly uh, blurred. Of course, to analyze what's going on while the human dynamics in this physical digital world, we need to move beyond the physical space as defined by the absolute space uh, that uh, Sri Lanka just outlined. So we need uh, to so, so the, in other words, in this emerging uh, metaverse, the boundary between space and place are also blurring. That's why we developed this uh, integrated framework uh, linking both space and place. For lack of a better word, we called it, uh, some, some geographers also call it a space. Next slide. So what does this all, all mean? What's what is we as geographers we, we often say spatial is really special. So what is special about this uh, 
spatial framework. So uh, after we, uh, Shilong and I published the, the, the spatial framework in the annals, uh, I can't believe it's two years ago, you know, we received the great feedback, uh, lots of comments from uh, an interdisciplinary group of our audience. M most recently, we have been thinking that this spatial framework, you know, in the larger scheme of things, it is really consistent with this uh, quantum turn for uh, uh, that is going on in the broader science, uh, science and uh, engineering field and in geo uh, uh, spatial technology in particular. Next slide. So, so for those of you who are not uh, that familiar with uh, the quantum uh, 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 turn or quantum uh, concept in uh, in general, or in geography in particular, I would like to remind you that uh, it's not necessarily new in geography. If, if you look at the literature starting about uh, 30 years ago, uh, in the late uh, uh, 1980s, early 1990s, so when I was in graduate school, shortly after my I finished my PhD, I, there have been some discussions. But the interesting thing is, uh, uh, you know, it's not only discussed by GI scientists, but also physical geographers um, and also human geographers. The irony is uh, during the past 30 years or so, this uh, call for a quantum leap in geographical thought or geographical research has not generated a whole lot of uh, uh, follow followers. And there is a, it will be a fascinating study why that is the case. But based upon what uh, we can observe during the past uh, decade and the last five years in particular, things are changing rapidly. I think it's about time to rethink uh, about the quantum framework that uh, geographers uh, have talked about uh, 30 years ago. And uh, uh, I think this uh, is consistent with what Shilang and I have been trying to articulate in our spatial framework for the next generation of GIS and the GI science research. Next. Okay, so our, um, for the human di dynamics part, you know, our framework actually is grounded in the emerging, uh, uh, so-called emerging quantum social science. You know, there's basically three school of thoughts. One is more focused on the, the from a methodological perspective, um, as uh, uh, you, you know, uh, embodied in the first book we listed on this uh, slide. So, you know, using essentially using new quantum algorithms and the quantum taking quantum te uh, computing technology to improve, uh, you know, the the traditional spatial data handling. And the second school of thought is uh, uh, embodied by um, this social theorist uh, uh, meeting the universe halfway that is more using quantum physics and the entanglement as a metaphor to rethink conceptually what we are doing in studying uh, human behavior and human dynamics. And the third school of thoughts in this emerging quantum science is uh, 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 led by my a former colleague uh, Alex Wendt, who is at Ohio State, who is a political scientist, one of the best known international relations expert. He, uh, I think uh, uh, seven years ago, he published uh, this book, Quantum Mind and Social Science. What he's, his uh, uh, argument is more sweeping. He's really trying to uh, develop a unifying physical and social ontology, not just using quantum uh, concept as a metaphor, but he really believes our uh, human mind and uh, human behavior in the real physical sense are quantum in nature. So these are the sort of a school, uh, three emerging school of thoughts in quantum social science that uh, are really uh, uh, shed a lot of light on some of the, uh, the human dynamics we are thinking in terms of the emerging uh, metaverse. Next slide. But here's uh, the broader uh, 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 scene uh, when we are talking about uh, the quantum leap for spatial data uh, uh, science and the spatial information uh, uh, theory. It's not just uh, should not just be grounded in the uh, quantum social science, but also 
grounded more in the emerging uh, quantum uh, uh, computing, quantum communication, quantum materials, and the quantum sensing. Because these are the sort of a four force research in the scientific, in the engineering uh, frontier. Whenever I talk to my colleagues at Virginia Tech uh, uh, in physics or electric engineering, I notice that, you know, that in the broader uh, science and engineering field for those uh, experts working on um, the quantum leap, these are the four areas uh, that they uh, are working on. And uh, of course, all this, don't forget GA science as a technology is a computer based technology. And that this at the intersection of quantum computing, quantum communication, quantum material, quantum sensing, it will be a new generation of technology that would be at the, that will change everything we do. And as a GI scientist, of course, when we bring in the human human dynamics into the picture, that's uh, uh, the how we need to bring, uh, think about uh, all these uh, latest uh, conversation and development in quantum social science and also quantum arts. Next. So in terms of quant uh, um, quantum computing from a more technical sense, I don't have time to uh, uh, get into all the details, but uh, suffice, suffice it for me to say that uh, this is uh, definitely um, um, a game changer because our the current computing technology is based on the classic bit, the binary zero and the one, but the quantum computing uh, is based upon the quantum concept related to superposition. It's uh, uh, not a, a binary either or, it's anything between zero and, and one. And Google, in collaboration with uh, uh, UC Santa Barbara and many other universities in the US, they already declare, declared Quantum superiority, uh, uh, quantum superiority, uh, supremacy, or uh, quantum advantage—that is a, a less charged term. So, so what they are, they have demonstrated so far is uh, uh, this new computing paradigm based on quantum uh, qubit will be not only uh, uh, you know improve the speed in terms of uh, uh, handling the big data, but also the uh, in terms of uh, security, cybersecurity, it will be uh, 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 really a revolutionary. So next slide. So the for the quantum leap related to uh, uh, GIS and geospatial uh, concept, especially the spatial framework, Shulang uh, just uh, outlined. I think uh, we need uh, uh, to. The next generation of GI science is needed to be well versed in these four con uh, concepts related to uh, entanglement, or uh, Albert Einstein and his colleagues uh, call it uh, non locality, or, or the Einstein also called it spooky actions at a distance. If you think about uh, uh, the metaverse uh, or the, this emerging digital world we are in, you know, that's a uh, lot of uh, happen things are happening. Can, be better uh, be explained by in, uh, entanglement instead of the traditional spatial interaction based upon gravity model, uh, uh, you know, using the traditional spatial interaction model. And the second uh, co concept, core concept in quantum for the quantum theory is complementarity, but behind it is really this holistic framework. I think our spatial framework is a embracing holism, a holistic holistic framework, try to connect to uh, multiple dots uh, along multiple dimensions. This is uh, analogous uh, to the physicist uh, uh, debate uh, 100 uh, years ago related to the wave or particle debate. It's not an either or world, it's, it's uh, both and uh, and. Uh, and uh, related to complementarity is a super a position and a potentiality is uh, not a, a binary zero and one, but uh, it's anything in between. Last but not least, we need when we bring in the um, the human into the very center, as shown in our framework, that will change our fundamental concept about uh, uncertainty. And the only thing certain actually is uh, un uncertainty. 
uh, and that's uh, uh, so, so using the quantum physicist vocabulary that is uh, the observer and the observer observed are really uh, interconnected in a very deep way. And I think to think about uh, human dynamics in, uh, in the emerging met uh, metaverse, we have to embrace this uh, quantum non-deterministic uh, aspect uh, uh, of uh, the human dynamics in the emerging uh, metaverse. Next slide. So, so in terms of the research agenda, you know, a quantum leap for um, spatial data science is really multifaceted. It, um, you know, we need a uh, work to uh, along the methodological technical uh, dimension. So in this regard, I think uh, we have a lot to learn in cognitive uh, psychology. Uh, I recently talked to a few of them, you know, they have embraced the quantum like, uh, like uh, uh, Bayesian statistics, uh, you know, to embrace the human subjectivity, uh, you know, doing all different kinds of data analysis uh, and the modeling. And also, um, you know, with the, the uh, uh, new computing emerging uh, uh, paradigm uh, that we uh, needed to work to you, you deploy those uh, technologies for spatial data handling. For theoretical conceptual uh, uh, implications, I think they, we needed to rethink uh, our overarching framework, especially how we are representing space and time. So our uh, spatial uh, framework in, in any ways uh, is trying to connect uh, multiple, uh, uh, multiple dots, which is uh, consistent in some of the earlier work uh, um, Tom uh, Bittner at uh, SUNY Buffalo has been doing. He developed uh, the, uh, like a quantum-based geographical fields of representation based upon uh, the core concepts of uh, uh, superposition. Last. But not least, if you think about uh, the GSI applications and practices and uh, policies in the real world, I think this uh, quantum uh, leap in uh, spatial data science and the practices could pr provide another very uh, uh, interesting, uh, um, robust framework then that will really try to synthesize all the previous uh, uh, literature that uh, GI scientists, the critical social series, uh, have been debating for several decades. Next slide. So, to our take home messages, I want to remind you at the beginning that Sri Lanka outlined that, uh, you know, their current generation of GIS or GI science practice uh, suffer two uh, major shortcomings, according to our opinion. One is it relies uh, too much on. Um, of uh, the Newtonian absolute uh, space. And secondly, humans uh, are not uh, at the center of the research. So by bringing other alternative space into the picture and also by focusing on the uh, human dynamics in the emerging uh, uh, metaverse. So our first take uh, home message is, uh, you know, human dynamics is really at a cross uh, road right now. So moving forward, we have the, the new reality or ontology we are facing is this uh, hybrid digital world that is neither physical or digital. Instead, it's uh, so seamlessly integrated. And, and secondly, you know, we need to move forward of ge you know, geographic and the GI science research. We need uh, to push for uh, uh, move back to the synthesis roots and the holistic thinking, and uh, the framework, the spatial framework, uh, where we uh, presented in this talk, trying to integrate uh, space and place, is a step uh, embodies this uh, synthesis uh, uh, spirit, and also uh, the broader big picture. Another very uh, uh, important message we want to take home is it is consistent with uh, 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 the core concepts in in the quantum leap that is happening in the broader uh, science uh, and engineering uh, uh, fields these days. And apparently, 
uh, we cannot uh, do this work by ourselves. So we are looking forward to hearing from you, you and I encourage uh, uh, all of you to criticize, to expand uh, uh, the, you know, the ideas we presented in this talk. With that, I think we would be happy to answer any questions that I would like to, uh, you may have. Oh, last but not least, uh, I want to leave with you a book uh, that is uh, uh, recently published by Carrie O'Brien. Some of, some of you may might be familiar with her, her work. Uh, she's uh, a geographer specialized in uh, human environmental interaction, but recently, she wrote this fascinating book, in my opinion, called You Matter More Than You Think. But the subtitle is Quantum Social Change for a Thriving World. So what the gist of this, uh, her latest work is really embracing <clears throat> the quantum social change <coughs> framework, uh, try to address some of the pressing um, issues related to global climate change and the global uh, environmental crisis. But more broad, broadly, I think the if, if uh, the core concepts of quantum social change are truly embraced, I think it will also help to end the growing polarization to address the other social equity issues that are facing humanity today. So with that, I would be, we would be happy to answer any comments and questions that you may have. Great. Well, thank you very much. I see a number of uh, applause or claps uh, showing up in the, on the screen here as well. Um, I'll leave it open to the for questions and answers. You'll notice on the on the right hand side of your screen for those of you watching, uh, you can enter a Q and A question there. Um, uh, so while you're thinking of those questions, you can jump into it. I'll also note that there was a, a question or a, a, a statement made by, by Yano. Um, Yano, did you want to come to the stage and ask that question or make that statement? Here is the question. I'll see if Yano actually wants to ask it. Otherwise, I can state it. Well, the question actually is, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or statement is uh, many important. Oh, here he comes. I'll let him ask it. I need to turn on the camera. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Very good. So first of all, wonderful keynote and so well coordinated between the two of you. Uh, I think that was absolutely splendid. Thank you so much. My question is this, and let me uh, preface this by saying that this doesn't take away at all from the analogy, which I think is fantastic, right? But many quantum effects or many of the, the laws of quantum physics only hold at very specific and very, very, very small scales and get lost at the scale of the human body and certainly at the scale of society. Obviously, what people in quantum social sciences are trying to do is they are not arguing that quantum physics holds, but they want to show that we need something more than this mechanistic view of society that we have by now, right? But my question to you guys is, how do we know when the analogy is still beneficial and when the analogy breaks, so to speak, and leads us in, in different ways? That, that, yeah, you know, that's an excellent, excellent question. Mike, by the way, that's uh, the question, uh, you, you know, that has been debated and contested uh, 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 in, in most of the quantum social science conferences that I attended in recent years. So, so here's my observation. So uh, those trained in the hardcore uh, engineering and the physics uh, tend to believe, you know, there's uh, fundamental concepts uh, in uh, developing quantum physics are really not a, a scale, uh, scalable not scalable, so they uh, are applicable or should be confined to the macro scale, you know, uh, of the quantum world. Uh, to the uh, macro world society, individual level, you know, that's uh, really a stretch. However, that, as I mentioned, that uh, when social scientists are talking about uh, the quantum uh, social, um, uh, applying the quantum stuff to, uh, 
anything beyond the micro uh, world. Uh, so there's three school of thought. So one is more purely based upon technical methodological view. Um, and one is more using it as a metaphor. And also there's a, a small group of uh, social scientists that uh, really believe uh, that uh, you know the traditional physicists' view that uh, quantum concepts are not scalable is outdated because there are new advances in neuroscience in the brain studies that are, that shows more and more evidence that uh, um, that uh, that quantum concepts are scalable. So so my view my view in uh, by the way behind the scenes Shulang, I discussed the, this quite a bit. My view is right now. I, I, uh, I'm agnostic whether it's scalable or not, but I firmly believe it's a useful uh, from a methodological and a metaphorical perspective. So I'm, uh, I'm not quite uh, uh, bought into fully into the third can be analyzed my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Alex Wendt uh, at Ohio State. By the way, his office was uh, right above me on, uh, uh, Ohio State campus. So while he was uh, write, writing that book, I read, read uh, several earlier versions uh, of his manuscript. We have the, but, but the more uh, he's getting into the work, the more in recent years uh, he seems to be convinced that a human mind is a quantum phenomenon. And by the way, I also observed uh, more political scientists believe uh, you know, the, in the, the politics that we are experiencing can only be explained by quantum, quantum as a quantum phenomenon. It uh, defies uh, the, the traditional Newtonian view. So with that, Shalom, maybe you have some other. Yeah, uh, excellent question. And uh, Dan and I, we discussed this also quite a lot. And also this question reminds me about the spatial interaction models. So when I'm a transportation geographer too, and uh, in graduate school, uh, certainly we were taught about the spatial interaction models that were very much based on Newton's gravity model concept. And whether or not human interactions truly follow uh, gravity model uh, proposed by Newton. Uh, certainly, you know, there, there can be a lot of discussions there. Uh, so, you know, like Dan said, uh, uh, whether or not, okay, uh, the quantum concepts are truly scalable, okay, uh, remain to be seen. But uh, uh, we think the concepts still can be very useful, yeah, to help us study many uh, activities related to human beings. Yeah. So hopefully uh, that answered your question, Yano. In, in, in so many ways. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. So still feel free to, to ask questions and I'll, I'll read them out in the chat or bring you to the, to the stage if you have them. Um, while people are thinking of their questions, I thought I'd sort of ask a potentially low hanging fruit question, but an important one here as well, given the, the previous session that came right before this on the discussion of, of ethics and privacy and, and what role we see ethics playing in all of this or what role this plays within the ethics discussion. So I was hoping you could comment on that a little bit. Uh, Shalom, would you like to give it a shot first? Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, another very, very important question. I, I was listening to the geoethics session right before this session uh, today. So, uh, yes, data privacy and uh, uh, the ethic uh, way of using uh, all of these kinds of sensitive data are very, very important. And uh, uh, you know, one one other thing we can think about is uh, really with the technologies, uh, the data are being collected all the way. Yano also pointed out that all of these cameras in most of the cities they constantly collect uh, our data, and uh, uh, in addition to Facebook and uh, Google, you name it, uh, and uh, with. Uh, facial recognition, okay, that makes it even more scary. Uh, but then, is that going to stop? Probably not, okay? Data collection part probably will not stop. So the question is really more who owns the data and how the data are being used. 
so who owns the data? That's really a critical issue. And uh, so now, you know, uh, with the discussion of Web 3.0, also a lot of decentralized idea, including decentralized science, okay? Uh, so if the technologies, for example, when we move into Web 3.0, it can become more decentralized. In other words, users can own the data they are generating. Then the whole thing could be different. Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of data collection, I personally don't think it's going to stop just because we think it's a very sensitive unless uh, there will be uh, legislations, okay? Uh, so uh, laws that prohibit uh, collecting the data. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, government agencies and the private companies and uh, uh, other entities, they are going to con continue to collect. So I think uh, the focus probably is more on who owns the data and how the data are being used. Yeah. Okay, Grant, that's an excellent question. So I would answer it from two perspectives. One is from the conceptual perspective, I think uh, the quantum framework uh, would be more sensitive to the legal and ethical aspects because it's a, uh, takes this holistic view, brings everything we do in the metaverse, uh, uh, you know, the uh, observer and observed uh, uh, thinking it together, rather than the traditional, like a ob objective view, you know, they make the uh, uh, observer completely detached from what we are studying. So in that regard, I think, uh, uh, I think that's the whole point of uh, uh, the, the, the emerging quantum social science to really embrace that the, the complexity, the multiplicity of the human subjectivity and how we needed to develop a technology to serve the human needs to that pr privacy is just a one of them. So, so, so that's a conceptually, I think uh, the quantum uh, thinking should be very helpful with all the legal ethical considerations that, that the GA science community has been uh, discussing. But from a more technical per perspective, I think all these latest advances in quantum computing will create a much secure world in terms of privacy. Because right now, from a cybersecurity perspective, all the algorithm is based on SHA, uh, SHA uh, SHA two family algorithms. So, 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 so the so-called secure hash algorithm family two, you know, those uh, uh, um, uh, so-called secure algorithms uh, are, are easily uh, breakable, uh, you know, despite of what they think they uh, are, are consumer, uh, uh, secure based on the current technology. But with uh, uh, the growing adopt, uh, you know, uh, maturity of quantum computing, I think uh, uh, that uh, uh, will be uh, a much more secure world in terms of uh, protecting your data and uh, providing the security uh, uh, and all that. So, so, uh, so I do think uh, it has uh, m uh, multiple important implications along these two fronts. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that you bring up both a variety of really interesting points here. And I do agree that, you know, encryption is going to end up being more and more of an arms race as we see it move forward to see who can get ahead. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I, I see that there is oh, another question. Um, Kitty posted a question, how will GI science education change? So if we think about this in educational perspective from secondary, tertiary, even primary education, what, what are your thoughts on that? That's yeah. uh, that's an excellent question. By the way, at Virginia Tech, my colleagues was in the news uh, uh, two weeks ago because they uh, uh, organized a summer camp for K through twelve uh, for the quantum uh, uh, workforce development issue. So they are so we do have a pr program at Virginia Tech try to bring uh, embrace quantum thinking in um, K through twelve curriculum, I think uh, there will be a lot more can be done from the educational perspective. I think if uh, GI scientists or geographers can be part of that, uh, that uh, would be even better be considering the growing application and the penetration of a geospatial 
uh, 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 tools and data and technology into every aspect of, uh, of society. Yeah, if I may <clears throat> add to this, yeah, I think this is a very, very important question. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the concepts we discuss in our presentation, really, they are not that new. Uh, so, for example, relative space, relational space, uh, uh, mental space, uncertainty, all of these are not new, even in uh, GIS or spatial data science. Uh, you know, the way we have been teaching GIS uh, courses, we choose among these many different topics and uh, try to cover. I, uh, you know, for example, people can use the uh, NCGIA co-curriculum developed uh, some time ago and all the uh, body of knowledge uh, by the UCGIS. Uh, but I, I fear in one way, students are lacking uh, overall framework in their mind to help them see how these different topics can be connected with each other and also can be used together uh, to tackle different uh, real world challenges out there. So I am hoping that the framework itself or the quantum concepts uh, connected to uh, the framework can provide a framework that can help connect all these stars together and a more holistic view to help you know, students understand uh, the scope of GIS uh, science and also uh, the connections among all these different topics within uh, the field. Great, thank you. Um, interesting questions and interesting discussions on a wide variety of topics. Um, if I look down here, I, I think Yano had another question, he said, um, only if no other questions show up here. So if Yano, if you're available or Kitty, can you bring Yano to the stage? It might be a longer question that he can ask there. Okay. And so my question is like this. About 10 years ago, I had the pleasure to, to listen to a great talk by, by David O'Sullivan, and he mentioned the role of friction in why we see something or why there is something. And it, you know, it kept me busy for, for the last 10 years. And I became a big believer in the role of friction in many processes of society. For instance, in organizing this spatial data science symposium, we had an artificial restriction on the number of people who can join so that we create friction out of, so to speak, nowhere, right? Because in a digital world, friction is, is a, a, a difficult to simulate problem. And myself, for instance, I, I am an analog, so a film photographer, so that I have the friction again that, you know, creating an image costs money, requires chemicals, requires time, and so on and so forth. So this brings me to my question that I have to you guys about the metaverse and how, you know, our life may play out instead of geographic space, where friction is giving by, you know, transportation, by distance, by the, you know, the rhythm of day and night to the metaverse, where a lot of this friction will suddenly not be there. Will we have to emulate this friction or will we do without? Yeah, I, I can try to take the first shot. Um, you know, I think frictions will be still there, even we get into the virtual space, but maybe in somewhat different forms. So uh, maybe different from the spatial interaction models, frictional factor. Uh, but, you know, in terms of, for example, who can access it and uh, how often they can access it and how much it will cost uh, them to access it, like you, you just mentioned. Uh, for example, my understanding uh, to set a quota in terms of how many people can register for this uh, symposium, that's also related to the cost uh, issue. So uh, yes, I think the concepts of friction will be still there, but they may show up in somewhat different forms. Uh, I generally agree with that, but I also <clears throat> 
Okay, I'm speaking my personal experience. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, there are some aspects of uh, in-person interaction in human that can never be substituted by technology mediated uh, uh, interaction. So, um, uh, so the, so for example, like, a, uh, like a, this uh, past summer after the IGO meeting in Paris, uh, Shalon and I traveled to Vienna, you know, they, <laughs> yeah, we, the first thing we did, we show, uh, we show the home major to Irving Schittiger by taking a picture in front of your university hall, you, you know, and of course, uh, you know, when they, we met uh, with you, you know, you know, in the local cafe near your campus, you know, that's a personal experience that uh, cannot be substituted by anything else. Uh, and also, you know, after we visit you, I Shulana visited uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, former apartment where he wrote, uh, he had uh, half of uh, his dreams when he wrote uh, the interpretation of dreams. When I walk into his bedroom, you know, it reminds, it gave, created an aura, an interaction, the sense of place that I, of course, I re read a lot of uh, the stuff uh, about what's happening in paper, but, but being physically there, walking on the street, being physically there on your campus, uh, seeing, uh, experiencing that, that I, I cannot describe it, but uh, I, I just uh, feel that uh, now my lot of views on things uh, are quite different if I have not been there physically. Yeah, if I may follow up on this, because this gets into a very interesting uh, discussion also about sense of place. Yeah, so, you know, our in-person experience in Vienna certainly had major impacts on how we understand uh, Vienna. Uh, but now, you know, increasingly, people understand different places around the world, for example, based on Google Maps, based on the point of interest, based on the reviews, based on the uh, ratings, etc. And uh, technically, that also could be considered as a sense of place. But this kind of sense of place comes from very different data sources and uh, uh, also can create very different uh, understanding of a particular place. And uh, also, I, I listened to the conversation uh, session with Rone, between Rone and Yano yesterday, and uh, you know, you, you were also talking about, for example, the training data set used for GeoAI, okay? Whether or not that's biased, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, one side considers that's biased the data to train GeoAI. But Yano also pointed out that data set actually reflects what's going on in the real world. So that's true to the real world. And, uh, you know, uh, so I think all of these, all of these are connected. All of these are connected. So I will stop there on this question. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think that actually just brings us to the end of our session here. So thank you both. Uh, I hope everybody will join me in thanking our speakers once again. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to speak with us today and provide the keynote. Um, with that said, we have a 15 minute break now until the next session starts, which will be the Nowhere Graph tutorial. So uh, I'll let you all join uh, breakout rooms if you want or the, the tables to have conversations about the, the keynote and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you.